what we have for today's talk. Welcome uh, to it. It's teaching that delightful, messy sacrifice. And I wanted to take a little bit of time to explain to you how we came to inviting Dr. Jeremiah Conway. Uh, so a little bit of background, and I got to say the name Rick Peterson several times. And then about a year ago, when I assumed the role of director of the Center for the Enrichment of Teaching and Learning, Rick came to me and said, my wife bought this book for me, The Alchemy of Teaching, and it's wonderful. And Dr. Conway is local, and I really think you should try to get him to speak and sponsor it through the center. <coughs> so I launched the center, and it's been crazy with the needs assessment and combining all of that and coming up with events that would look at tips, techniques, and pedagogy. So that's where we've been focusing, and then Rick Peterson again came to see me in May and said, so, Susan, what do you think? And uh, by the way, I even bought the book, and it was on my desk, and I had not had time to read it. So I had said to her, you know, I sort of hemmed, and I hawed, and I said, well, Rick, I haven't read the book yet, and I really need to think of always supporting uh, events that will cut across colleges, that will speak to all colleges, and so let me read the book. So I read the book, and I absolutely loved it. And in fact, I should put in a plug that John Cooper is in the back, and he does have a dozen, 20 books, if you were interested. But let me, re um, I want to share with you two quotes in particular, there were many, but there were two that I picked out that really resonated for me. He writes, without some larger sense of purpose for gathering facts, without some vision of what the knowledge of facts can allow us to accomplish, without the experience of delight and wonder in learning, education becomes a sentence to forced labor that all but the relentlessly ambitious or the chronically obedient refuse to tolerate. <laughs> Here's another one. Granted. Education is not solely accountable for cultivating humanity, and we cannot underestimate the contributions of others in this endeavor, the family, friends, media, churches, clubs, sports, etc. Nevertheless, the development of people remains one, if not the primary responsibility of schools. If education abdicates this task, it risks promoting a narrow intelligence in increasingly less humane creatures. So Dr. Conway challenges us to consider why do we teach? Why do we teach? And quickly reminds us that teaching is a privilege and li lives are at stake. And that's another quote from his book. Teaching is a privilege and lives are at stake. And so I reconsidered that perhaps Seidel should have a role in examining teaching holistically not just pedagogically, not tips, techniques, not solely that, but also philosophically. And thus I picked up the phone and I called Dr. Jeremiah Conway. A quick piece of housekeeping, because I feel like Cedal is going out of on a limb and saying, okay, let's talk about teaching philosophically, why do we do it? And so there is a very short evaluation. It's only three questions and it's basically asking you would you like more of this? Is this an event that you feel that CEDL should sponsor? It would take you 30 seconds to fill it out, and I would just love to have you do that, and you can just put it on the table over here. The other piece of housekeeping is that it's a beautiful day. At the rise of the talk, the, there will be wine, beer, cheese and crackers and fruit for us all to sort of socialize and gather and talk to each other as we launch another academic year. So let me introduce Professor Jeremiah Conway. He is a professor of philosophy at the University of Southern Maine. He is the author of the 2013 book, The Alchemy of Teaching, The Transformation of Lives. And I will strongly recommend it. And over, he has also penned over 40 articles on a wide variety of topics. He has won numerous awards for teaching, for example, USM's Endowed Chair in Philosophy and Education, as well as the university's outstanding teaching award several times, not just once, several times. His PhD is from Yale University and his BA is from Fordham University. In addition to teaching and writing, 
He has told me that he enjoys Irish set dancing, so we may encourage him to do that after he's had a, a glass of wine or a beer. <laughs> Keeping an old accordion warm and fly fishing. It is my great, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeremiah Conway. Well, I have my thanks to extend. I, I want to thank Susan Hillman for the, the invitation to speak here today and, uh, and to uh, Eric Peterson, the environmental studies professor, whom I've never met. Is he here? <laughs> Man, you deserve a handshake. Uh, I, you got here. Sincerely, um, thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you. It, it's such a lovely day. Um, I hope I can make it worthwhile for you. Um, my guess is that given the start of a new semester, my talk is expected to provide some sort of encouragement, some <clears throat> preseason pep talk. And if that's true, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the situation, uh, as I realize that the beginning of the academic year uh, necessarily means the end of summer. And I know from long experience that this May at the end of summer is going to trump whatever peppiness I can inject into your academic year. My aim uh, today is to engage in a meditation on teaching. Uh, in particular, I want to spend time uh, paying attention to the context in which teaching occurs today, to consider the obvious, um, which I think is the task of philosophy. Uh, I think that's what philosophy does. It tends to the obvious. Uh, there was a Kenyan college commencement address by the, uh, the novelist uh, David Foster Wallace. Uh, you were there. Lucky you. Well, then you know where I'm going. Uh, and he articulated a sense of the obvious and its importance by a folktale. And the folktale went like this. There was an old fish swimming in the ocean. Uh, who meets two young mackerel going in the other direction. And he turns around and says, Morning, boys, how's the water? And they swim past, and one of the mackerel turns to the other and says, Strange guy, what's he mean by water? <laughs> um, I want to think about the water in which teachers swim today. Uh, one thing I can promise is that I will offer no secret tricks of the trade, no best practices, no handy slogans. Run for the doors or for the wine and beer if, you, uh, <laughs> if that starts occurring. We'll end early. Um, so as uh, Susan mentioned, uh, in 2013 I published a book on teaching entitled The Alchemy of Teaching. Uh, it's largely a collection of stories drawn from my experience. It's about the interaction that occurs between teachers and students and texts as they work on and, and into one another. One story, for example, is about my experience, we've all had it, with the student from hell. Uh, well, teaching the, uh, I was asked to teach some Hebrew scriptures. Another is about an extremely bright student who's led by a text uh, by Plato to confront her driving need to be impressive. Another concerns a student who, while reading Dickens' Hard Times, uh, comes to uh, focus on the role of imagination in her education. Another chapter is about teaching uh, Friedrich Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra to a class, 60% of whom are women and reading passage after passage of what certainly seems blatantly misogynistic language. Um, much of the alchemy of teaching is about my stumbles, my trials and errors, and thankfully occasionally the, the successes along the way. And the introduction and the conclusion address why I wrote it. It all started with a painting. I was visiting my sister, who uh, teaches at a university in Maryland. And one afternoon, 
she's going to a faculty meeting and I'm left waiting in her office. And I started going over the office artifacts, you know, those things we keep around, knickknacks, plaques, you know, the sort of thing, which we surround ourselves with making a workplace our own. Frequently, these give real insight into a person's life and work who start attending to them. In my sister's case, what drew my attention was a small print that she had affixed to her office door. Uh, and it was a painting by the 16th century Dutch master, Peter Bruegel, <coughs> Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. That's the title of the painting. And although the painting was one, the print really, was one of, uh, of many others on the door, I knew that this one was special. Um, maybe it was because it was centrally, you know, it was really at the center of the door. And maybe it's just the kind of intuition that grabs you when you know a person well. I, I knew this one was special. Uh, it wasn't just another piece of office memorabilia. And for the next hour or so, I studied that print and wondered about why it was there. When my sister returned, my, our conversation shifted to other things, and uh, I never did get to ask her about it. Also, I had enjoyed sort of ruminating about it and wanted to puzzle it out for myself. And so it's been. That little print on the door, uh, my thoughts keep going back to it. Uh, finding it more and more intriguing. And these things don't end up with strict conclusions. Uh, but one conclusion that I've reached is that this print is perfectly positioned at the door of a teacher. And I've come to understand some of the reasons why. Um, let me show you it. this thing? Yes. Um, so, landscape with the fall of Icarus. Um, <coughs> at first glance, it's hard to figure out what the painting has to do with the fall of Icarus. The foreground uh, is dominated by a series of hillsides that oddly intersecting angles. On one, a farmer, obviously, and his ox are plowing a field. On another, you have a shepherd with a dog at his side uh, with his flock of sheep. Uh, another, you have in the lower right-hand corner, a fisherman uh, casting lines. Okay, is that better? Yes. Better. Okay, good. So the three figures I mentioned. You also have a series of vessels out in the water. Uh, prob most prominent among them, you have this galleon on its way out to sea, uh, and it's got its flags billowing in the masts, and uh, um, so what's it have to do with Icarus? Just a little background there, you probably already know this, but it's Icarus, uh, along with his father, Daedalus, um, tried to escape from the Cretan tyrant, King Minos, uh, by making wings of feathers and gluing them together with wax. And the scheme worked until Icarus flew too high, the sun melted the wax, plunging him into the sea. The myth for my money, is a story of transformation. It's about the human endeavor to overcome what imprisons us, the courageous flight to freedom, the overtaking, the overstepping of limits, and the terrible plummet we risk. As a myth, it's about change. It's unavoidably about pain. Pain we flee, pain we incur and cause, pain that can teach. But the most conspicuous element in the painting is how the event of change is utterly neglected. I mean, I don't know. 
Can you see where Icarus is? Yeah. There it is. That's all you see of Icarus, and you see just two tiny sticks of leg while he's going into the ocean, plummeting to his death. That's it. I mean, it's brilliant in a way. He entitles the thing about the fall of Icarus, and you have to look around, where the hell is he? Not only that, everything in the painting, if you notice the figures, they are all primarily occupied with their tasks, and they are all turned away from the event occurring in their midst. The, ox, uh, the uh, farmer here, notice the position of the head on the shepherd, the, I mean, if you get up close, you can see no one is paying attention to Icarus. Or if, it, if they are, it's just for a fleet moment, and then they're on to, on to their daily task. Yeah. Um, thank you. So my sense is that Bruegel's painting brilliantly captures the neglect. I believe that my sister had a number of reasons for having landscape with the fall of Icarus at the entrance to her office. First, I think she recognized that education, whatever else it is about, is centrally about human change. The movement of the human spirit, its flights, its failures, its courage, its pride, its struggles with sons and parents, with tyrants, and the deep. Knowing my sister, I understood that one message in having that print on her door was this. Don't forget this. Don't forget that in the middle of classrooms, in the corners of libraries, in the quiet reading of a book, in ordinary conversation, people can be immersed in events that are decisive for their lives, that put people at risk that make them vulnerable, and that call for our attention as teachers. Like Icarus, the students we are teaching are soaring near suns. They're dropping into the oceans like comets. They're struggling to escape labyrinths, and more than a few are drowning. I suspect a second reason for posting that print <coughs> was a recognition that in education today, as in the painting, we often neglect the change occurring in our midst precisely where one would expect heightened awareness to the pains and triumphs of human transformation. There is often the same inattention shown by the sailors on the merchant ship or the farmer on the hillside, maybe more. The painting offers clues as to why. Like the figures tied to their job, students file through institutions of learning today tethered to the line that education is the key to, successful, to a successful financial future. Education is increasingly, has been for a long time, about jobs and careers, about making a living. It is less and less to do with the making of lives, especially for the overwhelming majority of students whose inability to resist the immediate financial considerations, the immediacy of financial considerations, grows slimmer with every loan they incur, every tuition. But not only students are preoccupied with learning uh, as the pursuit of livelihoods. To an overwhelming degree, institutions of higher ed are caught up in the business of education as well. They cater to and reinforce the fixation on economic success. A clear sign of this obsession is the domination of educational language by the language of the marketplace and the fact that this language long ago ceased to raise eyebrows, much less resistance. Don't misunderstand me. The problem is not that education helps students find useful, meaningful work. I find that very important. My concern is with job and career preparation that fails to address with equal seriousness the development of the person. When students can go through entire semesters with professors who don't know their names, when professors are so focused on their fields and specialties that they forget that they are teaching people, education has gone profoundly wrong. 
No wonder so many students choose courses according to the time of day, read only the spark notes, and worry about the number of credit hours they need to complete until the yoke of education falls away. In this sense, the print issues a warning. If educators merely instruct, that is, ply students with tools and information without paying close attention to the people who will use them, then institutions of learning may succeed in creating simply more clever tyrants, more aggressive minotaurs, etc. Icarus's father, Daedalus, conveyed his technical skills and his knowledge to his son. But wisdom he did not, and as I think the myth says, skills and information are simply not enough. Knowledge without personal development is catastrophic. I entitled my talk today, Teaching That Delightful, Messy Sacrifice. It's funny. Um, when Susan called with the invitation, it was, it was the easiest title I ever came up with. She called, and within two minutes of putting down the phone, I knew my title. Um, teaching That Delightful, Messy Sacrifice. And uh, you know, I just went through it and said, oh, great title. It sounds peppy and encouraging. <laughs> and the odd thing was, my reason for it was another thing. The fact is that I was drawn to the title because while teaching at its best is delightful, messy, and a sacrifice, the words are disturbingly false if taken as descriptive of much that takes place in classrooms today. Teaching today is often not delightful. It's not messy and is not a sacrifice. Were teaching delightful, faculty lounges would be different places. There would be less talk of teaching loads and research opportunities. There would be considerably less burnout. Were teaching messy, there would be fewer courses jam-packed, so jam-packed with uh, information that they resembled forced marches loaded with backpacks through forbidding terrain. The messiness of teaching has to do with the complexities of human beings being involved. And this messiness is vital. But at times, it seems to me, we work awfully hard, it seems, at eliminating that messiness, as if we're kind of afraid of the muck of the real. The issue of sacrifice is trickier. I do believe, as already stated, that teaching is an act of service, one of the highest forms of service that we have, and that for teaching to succeed, at anything beyond the transfer of information, teachers must devote themselves to learning how to let the learning of students occur. Let me stick with this issue of sacrifice a bit. Sacrifice, as I understand it, involves a willingness to give oneself up for something or someone, to let go or forego something, as indicated often by a cut. If teaching is a sacrifice, it costs. If really engaged in paying attention to students, you pay a price, certainly in terms of time. It also costs in terms of space. You can't simply confine it to the classroom. It eats into your personal life. If you really work on your teaching, particularly early on in your career, there's a cost in terms of one's research. There used to be a running joke at Yale that junior faculty that received the teacher of the year would never get tenure. And not only was it a joke, it was true. One odder sense of the word sacrifice it is that it derives from the Latin meaning to make sacred. I suspect that this is true in teaching. Whatever we dedicate ourselves to, whatever we serve, cannot be sustained over time without resentment unless we come to love it. 
And if we glimpse the sacred, my bet is love is going to be at its entrance. Learning to let students learn, if it's to continue over time, must be loved. And then the sacrifice becomes intentional and unavoidable. And yet a great deal of teaching isn't sacrificed in this sense of devotion to the learning of students. Far too often, teaching isn't sacrifice, but ego enhancement. I know this from personal experience. Professors, and I include myself here, often love to hear themselves speak. We are more often than not clever speakers, but crushingly poor listeners. Sometimes faculty work with students an entire semester, and if you ask them, they couldn't tell you their names. I would not characterize faculty as more ego-driven, narcissistic individuals than any other segment of society, but I would not describe them as less. The possession of PhDs and titles does nothing to diminish self-centeredness. <laughs> I suspect that these remarks <coughs> will elicit some responses like the following. Got to capture the voice. Fine for a professor of philosophy to talk about the need to get to know students as persons, to listen attentively, to be flexible with lesson plans. But the reality is, unlike the clouds of philosophy, many of us, especially those in the health related fields, face the realities of certification, the necessity of immense technical training, the instilling of information that's imperative for students to have in order to succeed in courses at the next level. Philosophy and literature and the humanities in general are jealous. Softer disciplines. That should be very careful about lecturing anyone about teaching and how it should be done. There's much in this that I think is in this reaction that's accurate. There are rigorous accreditation and certification requirements in many fields. There are in some disciplines, complex tiered layers that demand coordination and cut down on the flexibility available. There is a need for definite information. The context of one discipline is not that of another. All of that I grant. But I'm sticking to my guts. <laughs> education, no matter what the field, must be an education of the whole person. In fact, I go further. The more technical the field, the more the persons using this technology need insight into themselves and others. And it's dangerous to pass this responsibility on to some required course in philosophy, if that is, occurs even anymore. And I, I may use my, lose my philosophical union card for this, but just sticking this responsibility on the occasional philosophy course, these can be failures. As technological training grows, universities will be distinct in terms of how effectively they combine technological training with humanistic development. For it to be education and not simply credentialing or job preparation, both of which will have their place, we must come to know to pay attention and interact with our students, be responsible to the reality that they are so much more than a seat or a number or an intellect. It seems to me that unlike any other enterprise, education is one place in culture that is specifically dedicated to human development. I, I, I think Martha Nussbaum had it right in the title of one of her books, Cultivating Humanity. I'd like to share uh, a few reasons why I think that cultivation happens often accidentally or sporadically and sometimes doesn't happen. I'd like to share a few thoughts about why. I want to inquire into the context in which teaching takes place today. What are we in the midst of? I know that this is a hugely imprecise question and intentionally so. Usually we narrow down the question to the context of USM or UNE or teaching in Maine, private or public, teaching online, young adults, uh, 
those kind of contexts. I, for the moment, I'd ask you to tolerate a philosopher asking a, a much broader question. What's the context in which we operate? Forced to a short answer, I would say we live within a modern technological world. Well, so what? So how is teaching shaped by that context? Lately, I've been much concerned with this question, and in pursuing it, have been reading some philosophical work on technology. One of these is the book, A Question Concerning Technology, by a German philosopher, Martin Heidegger, who wrote it in 1955. We're caught up, obviously, in a, a modern technological world. But what is this world, and what makes it modern? The usual understanding of technology is that it's a vast set of gadgets and machines and devices that are our, at our disposal. Technology is a, is a vast collection, set of tools controlled by human beings. This conception of technology is correct, according to Heidegger, in that it corresponds to our experience. Um, it fits the vast collection of barbecue grills, jet skis, power plants, GPS systems, personal computers that are all around us and are at our disposal. It is not, however, an innocent understanding of technology in the sense that it leads us to deal with technology in an especially dangerous way. If we look at technology as a vast reservoir of tools, we're led to assume that technology is neutral in terms of its effects on us. Pressed, we will often resort to the platitude, it's how we use those tools, not the tools themselves, just as we say in guns. Tools, we assume, are neutral. We can pick up a tool or put it down and be unaffected by it. Heidegger is suspicious <laughs> that this understanding of technology blinds us to what modern technology really is. It forces the, uh, fosters the assumption that we are masters of it, and that if and when problems arise because of it, it's only a matter of figuring, figuring out how to use the technology better or to develop more sophisticated technology to correct them. In other words, problems are only managerial or technical. We just have to manage the resources more efficiently and responsibly. Heidegger disagrees. Technology, he argues, is a way of revealing things, of letting them appear to us in certain ways and not others. For example, a sword from the Middle Ages reveals a great deal about the world in which it was set, the presence of warfare, the strength of the people wielding the swords, the calligraphy on it often testifies to their beliefs in, 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 in the divine, uh, it shows their level of metallurgy, on and on and on. What about modern technology? Heidegger's argument is that it too reveals things, but in a different way. Modern technology has a different understanding and relationship with nature than prior technology. It presupposes that nature is a vast pile of resources at our disposal that it acquires its value through us, through our plans and projects. Moreover, he pushes this. Modern technology not only uses nature, but uses it up. Think, for example, the difference between a family farm and a modern agricultural <coughs> business, which is what most agriculture has become. The farm and the agribusiness may both produce eggs and poultry. But the agribusiness is organized such that everything about chickens is treated as a resource and only that. The modern poultry enterprise limits the animal's space to walk, it introduces growth hormones, it processes them on what is a veritable flesh assembly line. There's absolutely no relationship between the staff and the poultry other than supply and demand. What's distinct about modern technology is not its size and scope of its operation. Instead, the difference is that modern technology manifests things exclusively as resources, actual or potential. Modern technology is generated by and in turn advances an understanding of everything as resource. To be is to be of use. 
If not of use, things have no standing, are considered waste, and are disposable. Things are not only revealed as resources, but are as appropriated as such within a worldwide network of interconnected use systems. In other words, resources are regulated, stored, transferred, secured through a vast interlocking grid that extracts and transports, manages and all allocates prices and stockpiles, for instance. Fuel. Unless we're very careful, our awareness of things is reduced to their appearance in the computer printout. Similarly, our educational system is inscribed within vast layers of grids. Textbook and online companies, unions, departments, and legislatures on both the federal and state level. And these are still part of larger frameworks, for example, a worldwide economic framework. People increasingly regard their education as primarily a financial arrangement. And universities, rather than countering this appraisal, merely accelerate. We would be mistaken to assume that modern technology only reveals things as resources. Human beings are also an increasingly revealed and treated as such. It's not accidental that most large-scale organizations name their personnel department an Office of Human Resources. Within large-scale organizations, the complaint will often be made, as a colleague recently said to me, Jerry, it's all about the numbers. To treat things and people effectively as resources, they must be measured, compared, carefully cataloged. Human beings become functionaries and are managed, educated, and entertained as such. Everything shows itself within an instrumental framework. Think, for example, the way our bodies appear. We use them to be more attractive, to enhance job opportunities, as a means to stand out, as pleasure maximizers. We set upon them with plastic surgery, endless diets, designer clothes, and cosmetics. Bodies are regulated, more profoundly self-regulated, to conform to media presentations about how bodies should look. Presentations so ubiquitous that they're internalized by us. And these uses, in turn, are coordinated by pharmaceutical and media conglomerates. Our bodies become instrumental goods. The context of modern technology is the sphere within which teaching operates today. The implications are immense and are all about us. Again, I think if you, to me, it, again, you begin to meditate on just the obvious. It's, it's about us. Higher education today, for example, is a competitive resource and is regarded as such almost exclusively. In response, colleges and universities have become slick, well-oiled public relations operations with aggressive advertising campaigns. Curricula are increasingly specialized, trimmed directly for job and career. Such curricula are often as conveniently as possible, often online, and by mercilessly, mercilessly exploited adjuncts. While prestigious, well-endowed, or religious-niched institutions may avoid some of these pressures, pressures, less affluent private and public universities must cater to the demands of students and parents for degrees that promise some economic return on investment. Departments of the liberal arts <coughs> survive, if they do, by recasting themselves into service or skill enhancement programs, basically they are writing, uh, providing basic writing skills, or um, so-called critical thinking or public speaking. <laughs> I'm uninterested in painting higher education as cravenly capitulating to what sense. I know too many faculty, administrators, and staff who have devoted entire lives to educating students for something beyond the buck. Nevertheless, it is my judgment that in the current situation, Many institutions of higher ed are dominated in no small part by high-paid accountants, financial planners, and public relations gurus. I say this without a snide deprecating tone. 
the sheer size and complexity of universities today necessitate administrative paradigms that borrow heavily from large-scale business organizations. If this language and mentality of business did not dominate higher ed, I fear many professors like myself would be looking elsewhere for a paycheck. If these are some of the implications of our technological world upon institutions, what about the implications for teaching? Here are some I find. The pressure to market oneself to student customers is more concentrated than ever before. Some might respond, three cheers. It would be a major kudo if universities attended to students like businesses regard customers. I disagree. The danger in such business paradigms is that we end up looking to our students and their parents and corporations and politicians for what we should be doing and how. We hand over academic responsibility for what education means to non-educators. And too often what this means is that we end up teaching to insufficient educational goals. Second, teaching is often encased within management measurement uh, grids that do not enhance it. Too often, for example, quality of teaching is measured by the bubble sheet of those that are taught. And at the end of a course, when well, nothing can be done about it. In some cases, we evaluate teaching with the additional step of the one-stop visit <coughs> of a department or a peer committee member, one visit in 15 weeks. Why? Because we're terribly busy, and these methods are easy and efficient. Often, evaluation of teaching is tied directly to tenure and promotion requirements. The point is, it has little to do with improvement. It has more to do with grooming ourselves for the one-stop visit or finding out ways to improve on the bubble sheets. We compile relentlessly statistics about each other, but in my experience, these grids often fail to capture much, if anything, about one's unique gifts as a teacher. In fact, what evaluations often promote is uniformity, uh, enforced sameness under pressure. In all my years of teaching, no administrator ever asked me about any story of my experience interacting with students. And you know the funny thing was, when the book came out, you'd be congratulated and do these talks at USM. Um, it only had importance when it's out as a book. Uh, third, we teach and will continue to teach to larger and larger numbers. And these numbers are, signi are a significant challenge to coming to know one's students well. Fourth, the content of teaching, I think, will be increasingly packaged, commodified, like apps on an iPhone. Also, our teaching will be more closely tethered to immediate short-term goals, the same process we see in our business and government longer range issues, who we are becoming, what we are about, what we're in the midst of, what are we doing about it, what cultivating humanity could mean in our times will either not get discussed or glossed over in a one-day conference. If this analysis of our context holds water, and I may be very wrong, I may just have read too much Heidegger on this, um, but if this analysis holds water, then the next question becomes, how do we operate within it? Because the prospect of that this context will change is debatable. And is certainly the case, it ain't going to change easily or rapidly. So how to operate within it? My short answer is, uh, one learns to walk a tightrope. Tightrope walking applies to universities, but I speak here of individual faculty. One, given the push for larger class sizes and increasing specialization, I think we must do everything we can, no matter what the cost, to lean the other way, getting to know our students better, and with, within this interaction to push them to ask deeper, more basic questions to get them to consider the water in which they're swimming. This can be risky. 
classes can degenerate into group therapy sessions. I hope you know it. <laughs> it can also be difficult to achieve in terms of time. Let me give you an example. I'm decidedly old school in terms of I have a real problem showing movies in class. And yet I know students are interested in movies, they're good at observing them, they're helpful in terms of uh, connection. I know the importance and the enjoyment of films for students. So for one of my, for each of my upper level courses, I offer an optional film series. Three or four nights in a semester. I bribe them with popcorn. <laughs> there are no set agendas. And somehow not having an agenda and leaving open what's the connection to this and what we're doing in class, it's like a free space, which is critically important for finding out how they are reacting to the material, what the honest reaction is. It's taken out of a classroom. In any case, my point is that if you're gonna tightrope walk, uh, you gotta begin doing some creative wobbles. You gotta fit, you can't fit it in because time demands here, you're gonna have to find something else. Or it's going to be as, you know, with what you do collectively with teaching centers and things like that. <coughs> My point is that tightrope walking demands ways of adapting to the winds. Second, the tightrope of teaching as I see it is balancing the largely instrumental thinking of students today with another form of thinking that actively considers the larger context, the goals and values we operate within. Let me give you one brief example. Once a year, I teach a entry level course on um, friendship. And, uh, <coughs> and in that course, uh, once I designed it, I was very pleased with the design and uh, I was ready for it. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. And the first three or four classes was, wham, it's like walking into a wall. Uh, this is not working. Uh, so I stopped what I was doing and asked them, why? Why has this begun so miserably? <laughs> uh, and students were bothered by the, f it started, by the way, I should add, with a text, the Lysis from, uh, from Plato. It's a wonderful thing on, on friendship. But they were bothered by uh, the funny sounding names, by the guys uh, in togas asking questions that didn't seem to end up in any sort of definite answer. Uh, I mean, Pulling the obvious pun, it was all Greek to them. <laughs> and I set aside the text and turned to him, well, what bothers you? And finally, the response trickled out, because it's so old. Why should we read something from way back when? I mean, history buffs, they were not. <laughs> um, and I realized I couldn't get to first base with this text unless this question was explicitly addressed. Why go back to ancient material? What did ancient Athens and these guys running around in togas have to do with them? Why consider it? The underlying question was beyond and outside the text. That's what I'm trying to get at. And if you're going to tightrope walk, um, you have to shape shift. You have to get to that. The underlying assumption was beyond and outside the text, but left undressed, unaddressed. Reading the text for them was like being dragged through a museum because some person in the front of the room says it's good for you. <laughs> to move forward, their underlying assumption about the irrelevancy of the old had to be addressed. 
And I hadn't anticipated one of their underlying questions and needed to change. Let me move to a conclusion. Um, real change is, I'm convinced, change of awareness. And education is the one place, when you think about it, it's the one place specifically in culture dedicated to this, or should be. It's the one place where, if it's going to happen else, anywhere, I, I think there it has a chance. Precisely because of these convictions, I continue to believe that teaching is a noble act. That this shaping of awareness that's possible in working with our students is one of the great privileges we can enjoy in life. So, uh, I'll get off the pulpit. I got two hopes for you. That essentially I would hope that this talk puts in mind. Two hopes. One, that during this academic year, you keep your eyes peeled on Icarus's legs. <laughs> <laughs> if nothing else, <laughs> where's my little, yeah. <laughs> Don't forget those. <laughs> That's one hope. <laughs> oh, poor guy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and second, that your classes, uh, uh, you know, let them be delightful and messy and and a willing sacrifice, that's what I wish. So, let's turn to questions. Thank you very much for your patience. Do we have any questions? I don't think we should use the mic. Is this easy for us to, to pull out? Oh, OK. So you mentioned technology as being the context we're working in. Do you think that's changed very rapidly? You know, and how quickly has that changed uh, for the professoriate? Hmm. Hey. Yes. Thank you. Um, one, it, it has long roots. So I think the modern technology, obviously, if you want to get fancy about it, it has to do with the origins of modern science. And that goes back to the 17th century. Um, Copernicus, Galileo, uh, Descartes. So there's a long range view. But I think now, uh, when it originated, there was a fight about it. You can find it in Pascal. You can find it in Gambiatisto Vico. You can find it in thinkers at the time. You can find it in uh, some of the romantic poets. Hey, something, uh, there's something going on here. If we look at nature as primarily only physical stuff available to us for our disposal. And um, there was worry about it. So it has deep roots. But my sense is today it's moving at a much more rapid pace. When Heidegger wrote these things about technology, I said that the essay was in 1955, it amazes me that he's saying what he does about technology. There were no personal computers. There were no iPhones. There was you know, nothing like that. And to think about the implications of the technology on us, uh, it's happening faster and faster. For example, read some of the current research the books that have come out on those students in your class when they're constantly on their phones and they're on the technology. I mean, there is, this is not philosopher's speculation. There's the book by Nicholas Carr, The Shallows. I mean, they're studying empirical effects on the brain. How do we process? How do we read? Changes in reading. Um, how does it affect us? the permanently distracted attention, the inability to concentrate for sustained periods of time. And the interesting thing, I think philosophers ought to pay attention to it, 
the singular thing, and Nichols is not, Nichols Carr is not a philosopher. The, the particular thing is, he talks about this will mean the loss of the ability to contemplate. Man, that's, that's big. Um, yeah, I spent some time reading, if you ever, I know a lot of you are in the health sciences and how I worried whether, I, God, I, I'm not interested in attacking the sciences. I spent this summer reading some of uh, Rachel Carson's uh, stuff and ended up with her book on um, a sense of wonder. And um, Heidegger ends up with the importance of wonder in our thinking and Carson, it's just, it's so strongly articulated about the need for that. And she's dealing with it just with a, nephew of, seems like a young boy, but the implications of that for teaching. Right? So back to your question. Um, does it go back far? Yes, this did not, this, I, I would trace it most immediately to the 17th century and the rise of modern science. Um, but it is occurring now at a rate where I don't even think most people realize it. Talk to students in your class whether they have any worries about the technology that they're using. There's no sense of anything being lost. I mean, that's what I find. What would your response be? What well, uh, use, use the mic if you're streaming it. Yes. The other campus. I would say that um, technology has, has continued to change through the ages. And, and so for whatever age, there's always a new technology that, that we're facing, uh, whether that's you know, computers now or something, ballpoint pen, I don't know. <laughs> um, and, and that the hazards or perceived hazards um, change over time mm -hmm. and that every, every generation probably frets about it and I wonder what the overall impact really is and, and how much of that angst comes to fruition or is ultimately dealt with in some We probably have time for one more question. Any questions from Westbrook? Um, no. Okay. okay, Rick Peterson would like to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure here. <laughs> so I was intrigued by your story about the friendship class. Yes. I think many of us in this room have come to similar places. Maybe we hit a brick wall after two or three weeks into the course. And it seemed to reflect your willingness to change to make a change. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm very curious to hear the rest of the story, like Paul Harvey. Um, <laughs> but also, to, if you have any insights about what it takes in a teacher to be willing to throw away some of or maybe not throw it away completely, but, but to, to change, to, 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 um, to make some serious adjustments midstream. What, and also, what did you do? What did you do next? <laughs> I'll tell you, with uh, one, it led to a real change in the course. The text, for all my liking of it, I ditched it. Um, <laughs> um, I, not in that semester, but subsequently. And I went back to a more ancient text. The <laughs> no, 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 this is a stroke. I'm a stubborn son of a gun. Uh, I, uh, I went back to the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is the oldest book, uh, in my understanding, that we have. It's fundamentally about friendship. Um, uh, but it was more accessible to them. 
uh, they weren't bothered. They were. It, they're only you know Inky Do and uh, Gilgamesh, and they could laugh about that a little. But it wasn't as it wasn't as forbidding as the the the, um, the text from Plato. Um, so that on a practical. I think it's a necessity, if you start paying attention to your students, you are, you'll know what is not working. And when their learning becomes central, and you just don't insist on this because I know it's a damn good text, then you start thinking, okay, what am I, what am I using this text for? What else might work? Uh, when do I have to stop and actually you have to create some space for their honest in response. And it's not at the end of the course that's useless. I sometimes think with courses, you pro it probably came across here, but I, I think sometimes it's, our classes are like packed with rooms that are stuffed with stuff that there's not the space for actual honest interaction. Is this work? If it's not, why? Um, and <clears throat> that goes on. Um, it also leads one more dissatisfied, I think, that you come out of classes um, and just take that as part of it. I guess I, the image of the tightrope is an honest one. I think it's, it's, it is a tightrope. Can I follow up on that question? Sure. So, um, you know, sure. you made some... I'd like to follow up on the question. You made some changes to try to engage the students. Was yes. there, you know, uh, learning and teaching is a two-way process. Was there anything that you asked them to try to come to the yes. table with? So I think yes. that's got to be important. To be... Absolutely. No question. Um, yeah, the response was, I couldn't agree more. And I... Uh, operate with one of my convictions is that when you are more active in a classroom than your teacher, than your students, something is wrong. So, you know, um, you have to demand that. You know, what did you demand to try to get that class to hit that brick wall? Right. Um, I knew what they were going to go on to. I mean, the way I think historically, so that when I design courses, it's not surprising I go from Plato, Aristotle, um, friendship. Uh, so I knew there was more old stuff coming. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew, I had a sense of, they are really uh, not convinced about the applicability, you know, that they couldn't see themselves in it. And I uh, started journal questions for virtually every class on the upcoming reading. And I told them, this is just showing up. Now, I'm not asking for brilliance, I'm asking for effort. And every upcoming reading, I would anticipate some way to try to relate that to them, formulate a question about that. And I like to think for those willing, it worked. Um, if they're not willing to play, there's not much you can do. And also, I think sometimes uh, you have to say that to them, that you could be Hegel and dance on a desk, and it wouldn't work. Um, so, But you're, I couldn't agree more. It's not, it's a, it's a two-way movement. They got to come forward. But you have to invite that. Yeah. You have to invite it. I would like you all to join in a round of applause for Professor Thomas.